So sure about what, Dad? About Carson. He doesn't stack up. To what? As a suspect. Don't put avocado on the burger. What? Simple is always best. Look, Carson killed Jordan and Atlanta. Then those two degenerates at Crazy Betty's Motel. Hell, he even tried to kill you, didn't he? Have you forgotten that? But Carson was a coke dealer. Why would he want to kill his clients? And what would be his motive for killing Alana and Jordan and the Moorwood girl? It doesn't make sense, sir. I'm sorry. There you go again. Now you're piling hummus on top of the burger, too. What if he was punishing them? He knew Alana was cheating on her husband. He knew that Frank and Goldie were making porn. And who would know all that? Someone they knew. Someone they trusted. You mean like a drug dealer? Sir, a drug dealer with morals? Come on. All right, I read Brenda's magazine. Christmas, the number one holiday for people going nuts. That's motive enough for me. This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Welcome back to another instalment, ladies and gents, of Silent Night from 2012 in PCs, a sub-series of the podcast Under the Stairs coming its way to you in December, where we're taking the beloved classic remake of Silent Night, Deadly Night, which uh, made its way into 2012, Silent Night, a beloved staple of the genre, and we're splitting up into five-minute reviewable segments with guests from around the world joining me for those five minutes. On this episode, we're doing minutes 45 through 50. This will be bookended by Santa walking up the aisle in the church as a reverend starts to begin his sermon. And uh, we'll finish with our protagonist, the deputy, asking a very drunk man, how about a uh, 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 Mr. Snow? Joining me on this episode is my long-suffering co-host. He is... He's a delight. He is a pure joy. I would argue he's a pure good. He is the he is the Schindler's List of um, of podcasters in that it's hard to find a bad thing to say about it, but you know it's an awful experience when you're in it. He is the man, the myth, the legend, the Baz. How's it going, Baz? Ho ho ho, sexy hose. <laughs> yeah, I like that. See, when you said about Schindler's List, I thought you were meaning it was because I'm mostly grey these days. <laughs> <laughs> I, look, I look like I was made in the 1930s. <laughs> well, listen, you're getting your second win, man. 50's the new 20. Apparently so. So I've been told. Apparently so, big man. I was an arsehole in my 20s, so God only knows what I'm going to be like now. <laughs> um, we famously, back in the day... I'm loving the theme here. The theme is that Baz loves doing these mini instalment in pieces. Things, because they're easy to prep for, easy to record. But they're also, yep. so far, have been movies that you did commentaries on in yep. or around the Christmas time that you spectacularly didn't enjoy. Yeah. And, and, and can remember next to nothing of. Well, the beauty of this is, at the start of every one of these, I get to ask you on the revisit... Did you enjoy it a little bit more? And I'm super curious about this one because this one is just pure trash, but it's entertaining as fuck. How did you get on with your full revisit of Silent Night? Well, the, the first thing to point out is I had actually forgotten that I had seen this film <laughs> until during the group chat thing that you'd set up. To That's right, I think, I think you're like, have I seen this movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she, like, yeah, yeah, we did it. Like, uh, and honestly, it was a good 20 minutes into the film before it didn't even came back to me. Um, I will say, like most of the others, 
I, I did enjoy it more. Yes. I, I did, again, it's it's not it's not a great film by any means, but this isn't a bad film actually. No. I, this is why I hate doing these commentaries because I get drunk, <laughs> belligerent, can't hear it, and because of my shitty ears. When I've got you and A N other idiots on with <laughs> rabbiting away in my ears, I don't hear what the people are saying, and I just lose all interest, and then I'm just drunk and angry, and I hate the films. It's literally why everyone loves the commentaries. <laughs> I mean, like granted, it. PCs and Rawhead Rex were shit. <laughs> this one, this one less. So there's a lot to enjoy in this film. It's, du- it's dumb as shit, but it is, it is, it is quite a big, good film. dumb nasty slasher movie and yeah. I kind of love it for that. Also bears almost no resemblance to the originals. This is one of these ones where the, it's a remake but it's just trading off the name of a movie with very off loose... Na- yeah. Because I don't think I've seen the original. I've seen a lot of the Black Christmas ones. I think I've yes. seen at least three of them Yeah, yeah over yeah. the years. Um, but but Silent I, I Night, Deadly Night, I've... the original one is... It, like there's like two maybe two scenes in this that are kind of copied poorly into this right. one but this movie is its own entity and it's kind of a shame I, I've said this on a couple of the recordings already to me the idea the premise of there's a slasher killer at one of these American Santa cons where everyone dresses up like Santa so it could be anyone that's picking mm-hmm. off people in the town that are quote unquote on the naughty list I think it's a fucking great original concept, like just like brilliant. The fact they feel the need to tag those elements in and then really yeah. go for a Scooby Doo ending, where you're like, "Oh, it was no one that you ever met during the movie." All right, okay, he's the yeah. killer. I, I, it kind of feels like that's the lazy parts of it. Everything else is kind of dumb and fun. Yeah, yeah, totally. McDonald's hilarious. Oh, like you cannot keep an accent in one. Like he's like he's like ah uh, uh, yeah he's he veers from fucking <laughs> like there's I think there's one of the lines in in one of my segments here it's like broad New York cop it's actually really really good but it's the only line he delivers like that <laughs> then like, there's a kind of Midwest thing going on then there's a London accent at points and you're like fuck <laughs> there's a scene in here where, where where they find the body it's one of the earlier ones and um there's. <laughs> There's blood everywhere, and someone's wrote the word bloody in the script, not knowing that he can't see it. The American accent is like, ah, oh, Jesus Christ, what a bloody mess. <laughs> 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 he does actually say the word don't. Uh, he says the sentence, and it's the greatest sentence that you would never think Malcolm McDill would ever say is, don't you tell me how to suss out a perp. And it's just uh-huh. all wrong. He's like, don't you tell me how to suss out a perp. Um, <laughs> Oh man, it's brilliant. But you, you landed a couple of good segments here. We throw them yep. out of order, so there's a very good chance that people have already heard our other segment. But on the case that they haven't, this one here is earlier than your other segment. Yes. Your other segment lands basically at the finale of the movie. And we get to do a little bit of a chat here about um, the pervy priest. Yeah. Uh, Reverend McKenzie. Um, and we're going to swing into this one here. So it kicks off at the 45 minute mark with Santa walking up the aisle. It's an empty church. The Reverend's given his Yuletide sermon of fire and brimstone to a wee old lady who clearly is sitting there because the heating's been turned off in her house. Um, and he walks in and we get this. And I've written the full monologue down here because this is fucking gold. Uh, as Santa's walking, he's like, about the ugly side of Christmas. How we surround ourselves with coloured lights and decorations, snow globes and griff wrap. How we convince ourselves that everything is fun and laughter. Dig a little deeper, friends. Christmas has a dark side, too. And I'm like, this is the priest. Uh, like, this is the town. That This is why the pews are empty, Buzz. Like, you grew yeah. up religious. I didn't grow up religious. Uh-huh. D- did you ever have a fire and brimstone pastor? Or is this yeah, the, the one that I remember, the... So I think I've said before, so my mum was a Sunday school teacher, so my mum was very heavily involved with the church when I was little. And um, the earliest minister I can remember, so I can't remember the one that christened me, he left not long after that. 
but there was this old guy called Mr. Girdwood, mm-hmm. and in my head, he looked like Ian Paisley, the Reverend <laughs> Ian Paisley, and uh, he had that steely grey hair and the kind of gaunt features yeah. and very angular kind of face and glasses, and uh, he was a bit like that, and I, um, I, I. I always had that impression of him, and then uh, just a few years ago, my mum and I were chatting this day, um, and he came up in conversation, and she said that, like, so we would normally, in our church, certainly the Church of Scotland, you went to Sunday school, Mm -hmm. you didn't really go to church, I did, because my mum would go to an earlier service, and then go to Sunday school, and I had to go to both, but most Times the kids would only really go to church maybe about twice a year, like at Christmas and the Easter. Right. The whole Sunday school would go in and would all be crammed in down the front, kind of thing. And my mum was telling me that, that basically the minute she arrived with all the kids, he would call her own. Now, Agnes, Agnes, when are you taking the children out again? <laughs> basically, we hadn't even sat down and he wants to know when my mum's fucking taking us out again. So he was a bit like that. But what this did remind me of, and I had a hearty chuckle at this. <clears throat> now, a, a friend of mine, or an acquaintance, which I spoke to you, I told you this story the other night. Uh-huh. So this was a, a friend of mine who was getting married. <laughs> a, a good number of years back, Colette and I were, were together at the time. Yeah, We'd maybe only been going out a year or so, and it was his, uh, his <laughs> wedding. Now, there, there's a very long story I'm not going to get into here, but... Suffice to say, we were at the wedding service. The wedding service was in the church that I went to with my mum. And the minister who was there at the time, he, he was old, he was he was past retiral uh, age. Uh, his name was Graham, and he was very good friends with my mum and dad. Um, mm. Really great pals. Even outside the church, they used to spend a lot of time together, him and his wife, my mum and dad. A lovely, lovely man. Couldn't do enough for you kind of thing, you know. And in the middle of this wedding ceremony with my pal and his then soon to be wife it, there was this 20, 20 minute like interlude <laughs> where he just lectured the two of them on the solemnity and the dignity of what they were entering into because he knew it was a farce <laughs> he knew that certainly maybe not the girl she was a lovely girl a local girl but you could tell my mate was just a co-caddled idiot, to be quite <laughs> frank. And uh, and Graham just lectured the two of them. Marriage didn't even last a year, so the big <laughs> man was right. But I always remember Colette turning to me in the middle of it and going like that. Is it always like this? Because obviously my wife's Catholic. Yeah. Um, but we were at a Church of Scotland thing, you know, so Colette was beginning to wonder if all Protestant weddings were like this. I was like, no, no, I, I've never seen this in my life. That's just because of that fucking idiot at the front, to be quite truthful. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was a wee bit of fire and brimstone that day. Oh, our, our priest starts going, Remember that chilly night in Bethlehem when baby Jesus was born into the cold world and laid in the filth of a filthy manger. <laughs> when King Herod massacred infants... Christmas has some bad memories too. To truly appreciate the beauty of Christmas, you must understand its ugliness. Sin is the beating heart of Christmas. You must understand that as pain and fear, war and sickness, death and famine, American Idol and internet pornography. Thomas Guthrie wrote, Who is the murderess that takes his life? Sin! Who is the sorceress that first deceives, then damns his soul? Sin! Who is it that brings old men grey-haired with sorrow to the grave? Sin! Sin is the reason that our saviour, Jesus Christ, was born. Now, while he's doing this, he's out the pulpit, right? He's worked his way down. Um, glaring at this old lady and like the poor old woman who's just trying to get a heat like and then walks to Santa <laughs> the, let's be honest 
clearly a Santa you don't want to be anywhere near because he's got fucking Michael Myers holes and he's dead yeah. behind the eyes. And he puts his hands on on on, on essentially the on pew. the yeah, on the pew. And um this is the bit where Santa decides it's the best time to chop off fucking Reverend's fingers, who's obviously screaming in pain and terrifies the old parishioner. Kinda love this though. He then stands up and vigorous is maybe a word I would use uh, repeatedly stabs the priest like about a hundred like this guy's guts are on the perforates that motherfucker <laughs> stabs like a shag bag Paz you know just, like, it does furious indeed. and fast and quick in and out and gone wash my hands um don't know why I'm what <laughs> don't know. was that a detail that was needless um I do like this though he stabs 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 and then he turns around and looks at the old woman and the old woman's like I won't say a word. <laughs> I won't tell a soul. Please don't kill me. Santa walks over, slips her a wee 50. You buy yourself something That's nice and slaps on my face. You buy yourself something fucking good for Christmas. And then um, walks out. I'll be I'll be honest. I kind of love this scene, right? I love That's it. brilliant. Two reasons. One, because the priest earlier on, we've seen him, he's been eyeing up fucking teenagers total dick right and um, my camera's doing weird things again which people can't see because this is audio but my, <laughs> my camera picks up hand movements now so if I do like certain hand movements it does certain emojis <laughs> and uh, it freaks it everyone that records for me Baz is getting the full effect of it but yeah I, I love it because one we've, we've seen the priest in one domain and then we see him lecturing parishioners on sin where he himself is fucking rife with it um, he's basically a time pervert and then on the other hand we get like a brutal kill because this movie whether you like it or not does not spare the rod Baz when it comes to death no. the deaths are fucking great in this movie Yeah. and this priest gets his fingers cut off all practical effects and then the stabs sound fucking savage yeah the, the effects are absolutely bitching I uh, I love this particular part. So obviously th- that's only the kind of the first half really of this little segment. Yes. But um, the the delivery, but the the overacting the um, the, the guy that plays the priest is is act is acting as criminal. <laughs> but it's so over the top that it's funny, and the, the bit that sticks in my head in your monologue is just near the end when he internet. Pornography. <laughs> it's the staggered delivery of it is absolutely bitching. But then, as you say, the the, the effects, the finger cutting yeah. effect, it's it brutal. Fucking gnarly, like it's absolutely really, really, really brutal. Gnarly. You see the effect of him lifting it up and his fingers missing, and then he grabs him in. It could be like a one-two kill, but it's almost it's about like. 12 shivs. It's right? frenzy, die. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, And then he gets yeah. flung over. And, you, like, I kind of... Once again, I love that element about this one because we get to see... There are certain kills that are really cheesy in this movie, right? Well, I think about the little kid who gets fucking shocked by a cattle prod. It's a pretty shitty kill. Even the woman that gets fed in the fucking chipper. It's the chipper. A, yeah, it's, it's not a great kill scene because something else is doing the killing. At the very beginning, the torso that we see, the woman whose head's been chopped off and there's just a fucking torso on a fucking cabinet and a hand in a drawer. That's someone who's like a psychopath that has done that. Mm-hmm. Like, And we never really get any kills that are at that vicious level except this in the movie where it, you get something that is full on like one man, one knife, one victim and it, it's fucking great. And like I say, the fact that it's juxtaposed against... A guy who's like trying to like basically tell everyone that Christmas is a like a horrible ho- holiday bathed in sin, um, and he dies right after it in a vicious way. Kind of makes me laugh. Um, but we are we're only halfway through this. We we need to get into some fucking incredible uh, back half. So we switch over. There's a, a parade happening. An announcement comes over. One hour till parade time, and our our deputy protagonist walks in um, to a CD bar filled with Santas. Right, this is like 
this is where all the bad Santas go. <laughs> I, I, interesting yeah. enough, when I was in I, last time I was in New York, um, I met up with friend of the show Vanessa, and uh-huh. when we were over, we went for dinner with her and the lovely Patrick, and um, yeah. they were talking about the day that we met them to go for dinner was during SantaCon. Um, in New York where everyone dresses up like Santa does a 5k run dressed as Santa through Central Park Mm -hmm. and I was like that must be like a really cool thing and she's like no because they all get horribly drunk afterwards and if you're out at like 10 o'clock at night it's just people dressed in Santa costumes thrown up into storm drains just a shit show just like like a fucking vial Um, and this is where they all go beforehand so she walks in and the the deputy goes up to the barman and she's like Who's the big fella in the corner? The barman's like, that's Steen Carson. He used to be a foreman at the mill. The deputy says, I haven't seen him before. Barman's like, I think he lives up at the motel these days. Love the name of the motel. She's like, <laughs> this is all corrected it as well to Crazy Betty's. It's not Crazy <laughs> Betty. It's Crazy. Denny's. Denny's. Is Denny's. It not? Crazy Betty's. Crazy Betty's. Um, and she's like, Crazy Berries? And the barber's like, no, the four fucking seasons. <laughs> this is the police officer. I just love this. And the deputy's like, nice. She gets her, her thing up here and she's like, base, Brenda, patch me through to the sheriff, please. And Brenda's like, oh, he's a little tied up. And she's like, it'll only take a minute. Then you get McDill. This better be good. And he's sitting in a room with two... <laughs> <laughs> two other Santas. <laughs> two other Santas who clearly are not murderers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're virgins. That's what they are. <laughs> virgins. Yeah. They're in desperate need of someone to empty their sack, Baz, but it's just not happening. Um, oh, ba-bum-tsh. This is what I'm here for. This is what I'm here for. Just like <laughs> pithy moments of marginal quality. Um, she's like, this better be good. And she's like, listen, Sheriff, there's a man here, Steve Carson. He's a former log worker. He's wearing boots. He's huge. It fits the giant <laughs> Santa profile. <laughs> and um, my tell right, in... deputy size queen, Camden. <laughs> <laughs> around nine inches around. <laughs> um, my Dill, I love this. My Dill's like, what's he doing? And she's like, eating a burger. <laughs> my Dill's like, why well, I fucking love this cat. My Dill's the MVP. Of this. It's like, well, that doesn't sound like the sort of thing a serial killer would be partaking in after five homicides. <laughs> Eat the burger. She's like, he lives up at the motel and I remember his name from the registry. And uh, Mattel instantly flips on that. Doesn't yeah. sound like a serial killer. It's like that. It could be your guy. Where are you? She's like, Jack. We've Bar. just cracked this case wide open. <laughs> <laughs> he was on a registry, you say. <laughs> what kind of registry? Um, <laughs> was Jimmy Savile on it? Uh, anyway, like she's like she's like, he's like, all right, I'm on my way. Just don't do anything stupid. And then he turns around to the fucking Santa. He's like, gentlemen, and he gets up and he walks out. And so the deputy walks out. You miss, unfortunately, this cuts off a line in your five minutes where this. Steen Carson did basically admits to date rape to a police officer and fuck all happens to him um, but she goes Mr Carson, Steen Carson mind if I ask you a few questions I was wondering when the last time you were at the motel and he was like this morning she's like did you notice anything unusual any new people around and he's like it's a motel, people come and go and she's like, but you live there, correct Do you, you don't know any of the residents and he says no and she says how about a, a Mr a Mr. Snow, which to me feels like a code word for hard drugs, Baz. Yes. I was never involved with that scene, but if you were looking for a Mr. Snow and you were adding a wee wink at the end of it there... You're looking for a wee bag of the cocaina! (laughs) Which, interestingly enough, for the listeners out there in Dayton this year, I tagged Baz in a competition earlier on. Uh, to win some <laughs> Colombian Colombian roasted coffee beans and a coffee maker. And what was your comments back to me, Buzz? When I saw bag of Colombian jazz, I thought it was drums. <laughs> See if you win that competition because you're effortlessly funny. I will not be happy. Um, 
Oh, this guy's <laughs> hilarious. Let's give him the coffee machine in the bag of coffee beans. I'm gonna be happy. He needs caffeine. <laughs> he needs caffeine. Um, that's a five minutes here. You you landed a good one. You get a death. You get primo silly Malcolm McDill. You get our clueless fucking deputy. Easily one of the worst deputies in the history of cinema. But you also get you get a good combination of gruesome kills as well as comedy. So what what I actually got Uh-oh. was the perfect five minutes for Baz <laughs> for two reasons. One, I agree with the preacher. Christmas oh. can be dark as fuck. <laughs> and two, I have been that barman. So here's a wee story. I went through a period, quite a lengthy period, where my Christmases were just terrible. And it started off due to debauchery. (laughs) And then I feel like I was punished for another decade after it, right? (laughs) So, in my late teens, early 20s, I was was doing my barman stint back home in the noon. Uh And um, my, my big sister, uh, had her first kid, had my niece, she, and my niece uh, was the first born grandchild for oh, my mum and yeah. dad. But at the time, my sister lived down in Blackpool in the north of England. So my mum and dad started wanting to go down there for their Christmas to see the baby, yep. which was fine, right? I'm 19 at this time. I just want to get drunk, make love to some beautiful women. Do you know what? what passed for it in the noon. And um, so I, I then started saying, right, well, listen, I'm not going to go. I'll just stay up here. Well, you can't stay up here on your own for Christmas. It'll be terrible. Oh, that's what you think, Agnes, dear. Trust me, I've got fucking plans, hen. Christmas is going to be bitching. <laughs> right. But then I went through a really weird kind of time. So one year I got... In fact, they hadn't even gone away. My sister was up that time. I was so incredibly drunk. It was my niece's first Christmas. I was so incredibly drunk. I couldn't, hung over rather. I couldn't go to my bed till five o'clock. A ruined Christmas for everybody. <laughs> Absolutely everybody. Right. So after that, they started going down to Blackpool. Um, I had things like, I, I used to get dumped a lot at Christmas, which was fucking <laughs> horrifying. <laughs> And I remember one time it was so bad that I'd been dumped and the, the girl that dumped me, her mum felt so sorry for me because my parents were all away that she made me go to theirs for my Christmas dinner and I had to sit and have my Christmas dinner with this person who just left me and her entire family. It, it was fucking horrendous. And then, then that kind of slow, it went on and on. And then after uh, myself and my daughter's mum had separated, Christmas then became this horrible kind of juggling the, the weaving about over Christmas and that. My Christmas has never got any better until I met my wife. And mm. thankfully she saved Christmas for me. And I love Christmases now. But the the killer story from that whole fucking period was the first time mum and dad went away. So I'd have been about 20, 21 maybe. And um, I was working in the pub over the holidays. Mm-hmm. And I was scheduled to work on Christmas night, so not Christmas Eve, Christmas night. And one of the women that worked in the pub was on a day shift, but she had kids. And I said to her, listen, I'm on my own for Christmas anyway. I would rather go out tonight, or on Christmas night rather. I'm more than happy to swap shifts with you if Mm -hmm. you work Christmas night. I'll work during the day for you you can have Christmas for your kids, have your Christmas lunch and all that kind of stuff. Oh, so she was delighted. So that's what we did. So I turned up at 11 o'clock in the morning for my first and only Christmas day shift in a bar. It is the saddest, (laughs) saddest nine hours you can possibly imagine. It's... Because I'm going like that, it'll be fucking dead. It'll be a piece of piss, do you know what I mean? And the, the, there was always a thing, I don't know if it was everywhere, but certainly the noon, a lot of guys would go out maybe at two o'clock, maybe for an hour, two mm. hours, have a few pints with their pals and then go home for their Christmas dinner again with their family, right? 
But I'll be going to see some of the boys during the day and all that. What it actually amounted to was about three hours mind-numbing boredom. Just as the realisation of what you've done sinks in, right? Mm -hmm. Followed by two manic hours of utter mayhem. (laughs) With everybody telling you what a wonderful time they're having and can't wait to get back up the road to their Christmas dinner. That's then bookended with another three hours where the only people that come in are old men with nobody in their life left. And it is soul crushing. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you're like, oh, how we, how we doing? Oh, it's Christmas is a hard time, son, you know. It's, I love a wee grouse. <laughs> Hate to tell you, but you're going to have to pay for it. I, I, I can't give you, I know you want me to give you this for free, like some kind of Christmas fucking miracle, but I just can't work it for you. And... Honestly, by the end of that shift, I think I was working till maybe seven o'clock at night. By about six o'clock, I had lost the fucking will to live. I didn't even want to go out at night, which was the whole fucking reason of me doing this shift from hell, right? And this old guy came in, and I didn't recognise him. And I, I, I'd worked in the pub for a good couple of years, and it was very much a, it was a busy pub at the weekends, but during the week, it had a kind of clientele just of all old age pensioners and mm-hmm. stuff like that that would come in during the day and would do their wee betting slips for their horses and have a wee drink with their pals and then they would go, you know. So it was quite an old man's kind of pub. We didn't do food or anything like that. It was just a pub for drinking in. And uh, this guy came in, didn't recognise him. Queer looking kind of big long fucking raincoat. It looked like a flasher. Right. <laughs> and uh I always remember I had, I was, this was in the days when you could smoke in the pub, so I, I was smoking at the end of the bar furthest from the door, and he mm-hmm. comes in the door and then stands at that end of the bar, so I have to walk all the way back down the bar. What can I get you, mate? I'm no your fucking mate. <laughs> oh, f- <laughs> fuck off. Merry Christmas. Just f- fuck off. <laughs> I was like that. I just looked at him, I was like, What? It's like, I'm not your fucking mate. I was like, no, 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 you're not. I, I was just trying to be polite and welcoming. But you can fuck off! And I literally threw this old man out the pub on Christmas Day. Fucking honestly, I've never been so close to hitting a senior citizen in all my days. Honestly. Yeah, no, like... It was, it was terrible. It was the worst shift of my life in any like job I have ever guy had. Scrooge that Bill Murray finds frozen to death in a sewer. <laughs> he fucking threw out. Yeah. So it, it was like I had been the barman, but I felt like the sad Santa at the end of the bar having a drink. Yeah. Uh, honestly, horrendous. Anyway, that's why that scene is absolutely perfect for me. <laughs> Well, ladies and gents, on that note, on that note, always a pleasure chatting to the Baz. He has another one of these. You may have already heard it. It may still to be coming up. I don't know. Maybe the next episode. The order's all fucked, and I don't care, because that's what I do on podcasts under the stairs. But he has another one out there. He will also be joining us for his Christmas Eve episode, which is this year is not a commentary, so I can't throw back another one of these NPCs somewhere down the line for a movie that he didn't. 2023. Instead, he's been uh, gifted the grace of Near Dark for a Baz in-depth review, and we're spicing it up with a little bit something that we are going to not announce here, just in case, for whatever reason, we can't do it. Um, so we're just saying Near Dark is definitely happening. Maybe something else. We were a little present for ease. Um, Baz, I'm very much looking forward to that. But ladies and gents, every single day, between the 1st and the 24th of December, you're getting an episode of the podcast under the stairs. And with that in mind, you'll be getting one of these tomorrow. So until then, take care and I'll speak to you tomorrow.